Good morning and good afternoon to everybody, to all the participants to this uh, uh, webinar workshop. Uh, today, uh, we are going to have a workshop about advanced characterization of solid material. I'm your host right now, and I'm going to be the one of the presenters during this uh, workshop. Um, my name is Damiano Catania. I'm a DVS product manager for uh, uh, DVS Adventure Resolution Endeavor here at Surface Measurement System. Our first presenter today is uh, Dr. Jürgen Tun, a principal scientist uh, and group leader in the particle science design at Roche. And today he is going to introduce us to DVS analysis in drug development from intrinsic property to solid form control. So thank you very much and let's enjoy the presentation. Thanks, Damiano, for this kind introduction. Thanks for the possibility to present our work here. And um, it's not myself who did most of the work. Actually, I present on behalf of the team, mainly Flavio Lack, Nicolas Martin, Pascal Fleischmann. Um, they did most of the work that I present today. And um, we have one example where we had a collaboration with research colleagues. This was uh, Paulina Jakubiak at that time. And um, with this, I would like to start, maybe give you a first brief overview over the, the, the content of the talk, a short introduction, some information on solid form control strategy. That's actually the, the first case study. And uh, the second one is how we used it for a BT surface area determination. What was at, at that time new for us? Um, when I start with my presentation, we are talking today about DVS, or in my talk, it's about DVS, and that's a rather old and simple technique, isn't it? It's a balance, it's a humidity generator, and nowadays we talk about fancy new techniques like AFM or electron diffraction. That's the, the buzzwords we hear in our community right now. So why are we investing time? to learn more about dynamic wave absorption. And that's what I want to show you within the next 30 minutes, roughly, why in our development, we still have such a high value creation using dynamic wave absorption as one of our tools. And um, one thing is we start with a look on the solid form landscape. And on a first glance, that looks rather simple. You might have some amorphous material, disordered only um, short range order maybe, but no long range order. We talk about crystals, and there if we don't have any different component inside the, the crystal, we talk about polymorphs or different um, coordinations of the molecules within the crystal structure. And, um, this means we have a long range order compared to the amorphous stuff. We could have solvates or hydrates where we incorporate a second component into the crystal lattice, which is um, a liquid at ambient, under ambient conditions, or which could be solid, then we talk about co-crystals. And if we have ionic species, we talk about salts. And now the fun is that we can have all of them together. We can have mixed salt co-crystals, we can have hydrates or solvates of mixed salt co-crystals, and we can have polymorphs of these solvates of mixed salt co-crystals. And then finally, you, you mill your material, your drug substance, um, and, and then you will have some amorphous parts on the surface of the material. So you can really have a whole variety of different combinations of those solid forms. Um, we try to understand uh, our material as best as we can. Before we go on, I would like to, to share some definitions which are rather old. When we talk about polymorphs, we mean crystals, um, a solid crystalline phase of a given compound resulting from the possibility of at least two different arrangements of the molecules in that compound in the solid state. This is a definition by Walter McCrone back in 1965, but uh, still a very valid 
um, definition of the polymorphism. If you go back, what means polymorphism? It comes from the Greek word poly, which means many and morph, which means form, so that you have different forms. And it was first mentioned in, in a fashion, 1656, but then also in context of crystallography by Mitscherlich in 1822. And when we talk about polymorphs, we need to differentiate between these polymorphs, as we have seen before, and other solid forms. Therefore, I called the, 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 the picture before solid form landscape. Because if we have the definition from Walter McCrone, we list that as solid of a given compound. And if we talk about solvates or hydrates, I mean, this is not within the definition of Walter McCrone. So, because then we have a different composition if you compare it to an anhydrous form. Sometimes it's called pseudopolymorphs. I just use the wording solvates or hydrates, um, but um, we prefer to use the, the, the wording solid form if we talk about different crystalline forms and amorphous. So this includes really the whole variety of, of possibilities. Why is it important to think about this? And there I have some um, references, literature references. This is mainly focusing on, on true polymorphs, but I think it's also true for solvates and hydrates. Um, also from Walter McCrone, we have this quote, it's at least this author's opinion that every compound has different polymorphic forms, or in more general, we could say solid forms. And that in general, the number of forms known for a given compound is proportional to the time and money spent in research on that compound. And from my experience in the pharmaceutical industry, in most cases, that's really true. The more time you spend, the more solid forms you will find. And then also we have a, a quote from Joel Bernstein, um, who says, the possibility of polymorphism may exist for any particular compound, but the conditions required to prepare as yet unknown polymorphs are by no means obvious. And um, this means, in, in principle, it fits to the Macron statement, you need some time and you will find something, but it's not obvious that you will find, you, you don't have a recipe how to get it. So why do we think it's really necessary? And I want to share some examples um, from the past where you see that also, especially with transformation from an anhydrous form into a solvate or a hydrate is of, of interest for our research. In, back in 1988, there was a failure of carbamazepine because there you can see it's a conversion from an anhydrous form to a dihydrous form. And this, of course, will change the solubility and may significantly impact the bioavailability of your drug. You have another case in um, 1998 where we have this famous Ritonavir case. Here you have a polymorph issue, so you get a, a more stable polymorph. This was one of the, the key events that triggers these polymorph screenings in, in, in our Days, um, research departments. Then you have uh, in 1999, there was some issues with Vermox tablets. Also here it's on, on polymorphs. But if you have a look on in 2010, we have um, these Kumadin tablets. And here it's also that you have a solvate incorporated. So the a variable isopropanol content turned out to have um, different crystalline forms and if you dehydrate this solvate you get an amorphous formation these amorphous parts also will have an impact on your solubility behavior so on this page at least we have two different two events with uh, not only talking about polymorphs but also about solvates and hydrates and that brings us back to this to my introduction where i said why do we still use dvs because we are living in a world with humidity. And if we pro produce our APIs, our drug substance materials, or our drug product materials, we work with solvents. So it's necessary for us to understand the solid form landscape also in the presence of these solvates. And this brings me to the next part of, of this talk. It's about the solid form control strategy. 
And um, there is a key requirement from the health authority um, yeah, departments um, that you perform a solid form screening. And um, this is it's a more technical document in this ICHQ6A. You need to perform a polymorph screen on the drug substance. Can you define dif different polymorphs? If no, you're fine. If yes, you need to characterize them. I think everyone would do that in a scientific environment. You don't need to have a, a, a document for this. But then I, I like this, this statement here because it's a really uh, philosophical question. Do the forms have different properties, solubility, stability, melting point? Yes or no? And to be honest, I always struggle with this question because I mean, they have different crystalline forms. They have different crystal lattice and they're hence lattice energies. So of course they will have a different solubility um, value. It might be very similar, but it's different per, by definition. But if it's different, does it make an, has an effect on the product safety performance or efficacy? In some cases you would say no, and then also no action is needed, but if yes, you need to set an acceptance criteria. So why do I show this here? Because I think that's in principle only a technical document that, that's required if you want to um, get your approval on your, drugs, on your drugs. But in principle, this is a scientific workflow. We need to understand our product. We need to understand our drug substance molecule, how it behaves. And we need to find a process that robustly will deliver the desired solid form we have selected. So we need to develop a solid form control strategy. We need to understand our solid form landscape. We need to identify the transition paths between different solid forms. And this happens in our case between uh, with a close collaboration between the thermal analysis lab where the DVS instrument is located and the solid form screening laboratory. Then you need to identify the process relevant solid forms. And if you know this, you can establish some kind of a holistic control strategy based on these intrinsic properties and based on your process, because you know your perm parameters from the process. If it's a, a wet granulation in the drug product or if it's a dry granulation, and this you can incorporate into your control strategy. So you have a, a strong scientific and database rationale that demonstrate the robustness of your manufacturing process um, with respect to the patient safety, and um, which means no change of the selected solid form during production or life cycle. And we use some kind of this picture just to, to show this holistic view. So you have the intrinsic properties of your material, you have procedural and parametric controls in place by the adaption or the, the design of your process, and you have an attribute control at the end, which in principle is kind of a release analytics you apply. So with this, I would um, go further. Um, if you think about this control strategy, it means it might be difficult to find analytical tools. So especially when we think about drug product um, applications, you have a very low drug load, and then you need to think you are looking for meter-stable or unstable polymorphs or labile hydrates and solvates. So that might be rather tricky. And that's why we think it's necessary to, to, identify, to have an understanding of the solid form landscape of your pure material as well, because this helps you and gives you some warning signals if you think about hydrate formation or something like that. And so the idea behind the control strategy we implemented in, in our shop, and I think Dara is also online, who was at that time postdoc and developed a lot of tools for us here. Um, during this workflow is not to minimize the production environment, the production equipment. The idea is to, to understand your solid landscape and then apply stresses that occur during your manufacturing process. So don't miniaturize your equipment, but simulate the stresses. And then based on those outcomes, you can really build a scientific rationale for your control strategy. So now let's jump to some, some applications and case studies. And uh, the first one is a rather simple one. You just have one solid form. When we think of back to this uh, 
quote from Walter McCrone. Maybe in that case, you simply didn't have enough time to look deep into those um, into this compound. Um, but of course, also we have compounds that where we only have one solid form, one crystalline solid form, and it's fine. So for this product, you don't have any problems with respect to the solid form, at least. But we might have more complex cases, and this is also a true example. That this is not just an image. Um, what you can see here is uh, a solid form landscape of a, a yeah, it's already marketed product. Um, this is the selected solid form. It's a mono HCl salt. It's a polymorph, and all the lines here are transition paths. So you can see it's a rather complex um, landscape. And at the end, we want to convince the, the health authorities that we are able to robustly deliver this uh, selected solid form and without having changes to all the others seen in this diagram. Of course, not all of those solid forms here are within process relevant solvents. This will limit the space. But nevertheless, you need to understand the whole figure before you can minimize your um, rationale on the process relevant solid forms. Within this graph, we have kind of a hydrate family, and I want to show the benefit of the DVS for the elucidation of this hydrate family here. And when we have a closer look on this, we can see that we have a polymorph, which is stable at really low relative humidities. We have a hemihydrous form. We have a monohydrate, a tetrahydrate, and above 90% relative humidity. We have also a heptahydrate. And you see, this is reversible. You see all these um, arrows going up and down. So this is a reversible conversion. You need to understand this because if you want to submit your sample for certain analysis, XRPD, if you don't care about your relative humidity, you might end up with a different solid form than you originally expected. And if you know this is a this will always be in equilibrium at your conditions you you're, you're measuring then immediately shows you that um, that you need to take to need to understand the, the behaviors of your hydrous forms um, maybe one rush specific thing we have an internal nomenclature system for our poly or solid forms so it's not so that every scientist can claim this is a new solid form that's form a or form b or form six um, so we have all the experts from X-ray spectroscopy, thermal analysis, and solid form screening lab that meet regularly, and they discuss the data and then say, okay, that's really a true solid form. We have a full understanding on this on this form, and then it's really designated as form four, for example. And this explains all the here. You have form two, form four, form five, form six, form seven. So you see, also here is it's not in in order that you would have set it um, from the beginning, but this simply shows how you detect those solid forms. So these are five solid forms, and in pr principle, you need only one DVS in, um, run to detect all those solid forms. You see those steps and uh, also some kind of um, hysteresis. Um, you can clearly see that the st stability regions of those different hydrous forms. You can see the, hepta, uh, the, the hemihydrate, monohydrate, tetra, and the heptahydrate. And that's really also in the, in the um, mass change plot, you can, can see this quite nicely. It's rather difficult to, to see this uh, hemihydrous form, but when you know that there needs to be, that there should be something, you clearly see this step here as well. So that's really um, in, in both cases you can see it uh, during this absorption and desorption cycle. This was a perfect example for us to, to study also the application using a Raman coupled to the DVS instrument. And this was one of our test cases when we tried this. And what we did was we. we repeated in principle this cycle, we only went up to 90 degrees, so we don't, won't see the heptahydrate here. 
But um, you can see those dots were where we measured the Raman at the end of each of those steps. And what you can nicely see that when you overlay your structures, you clearly see a difference between the monohydrate and the anhydrous form. And you can see a difference between the tetrahydrate and the monohydrate. And for me, this was really interesting to see because I haven't had experience with these Raman couplings on the DVS before. You need to take, keep in mind that during the measurement, the focus of your Raman spot is not on the sample. You don't want to burn it. We have maybe some labile solvates, hydrates, and we, we don't know what, what happens if you have the, the focus of your Raman probe on the probe. So your focus is a bit off. And um, this means that you might lose resolution and, and, and uh, intensity. But nevertheless, we can see differences for those hydrates. And here also keep in mind, this, these hydrates are reversible hydrates. So the binding to the, within the crystal lattice might not be so strong. So you might only have subtle changes to your crystal structure. But nevertheless, you can see this difference between the anhydrous and the, the anhydrate and the monohydrate and the monohydrate and the tetrahydrate. It's a bit more difficult for the hemihydrate. So we did a, some more uh, experiments trying to, to elucidate this. And we used this kind of a ramping or dynamic uh, measurement, only focusing on this first 30%. And here you can clearly see the, the formation of the hemihydrate as a step. And you can also see the Raman measurements. Um, but to be honest, on, on a first glance, similar. And um, when you have a look at the overlay, also here you can see only subtle changes. You can see that the, between the anhydrate and the monohydrate, the blue and the black, you can see differences on those are significant. Also here between the blue and the, the black one, you can see a clear difference, but the red one, it, could, it looks like just to be a mixture. And also in our other wave number area, this seems to be rather simple. And um, also here you can see differences between the black and the blue. Uh, the, the, yeah, the black and the blue, but the red one, it looks just as if it would be a mixture. So for this hemihydrous form, where you really have only minor changes between the original anhydrous form and your monohydrate, um, this seems not to work. Nevertheless, as we work also in close collaborations with uh, the colleagues from the X-ray laboratory, and um, on the X-ray, you can clearly see the formation of this hemihydrous form. We have the anhydrous form. This is, is a um, humidity dependent XRPD analysis. You can see peaks for single peaks, singular peaks for the hemihydrous form and singular peaks for the monohydrous form. So with XRPD, you are more sensitive in this case for this drug substance molecule to detect these differences. Nevertheless, I mean, with one DVS experiment, we could already um, elucidate the transitions between those hydrates within the solid form landscape. And you, as I said at the beginning, you really need to understand uh, your transition paths before you want to set your control strategy for your product. At the end, you want to convince yourself that your process is robust and also the health authorities that you have a robust process in place to um, produce the selected solid form. And to do so, you need to understand all those arrows in, in this area. And DVS is one of the instruments, especially with a coupling, um, to elucidate a lot of these um, transition paths. With this, I want to change gears and talk about BET surface area. And to be honest, I am not an expert in BT specific surface area determinations. But uh, at some point a few years ago, we were asked if we would have a method to determine this specific surface area. Um, 
for a product which is called um, melanin um, from different sources. And typically you use these classical BET measurement approaches. And um, the, but for this, the problem was that they wanted to um, characterize this melanin from sources from the port gene eye, sepia and synthetic. The, the synthetic one is not an issue, you can buy it kilogram wise. That's not an issue. Also sepia it can be extracted rather simple. Problem is the material from the port gene eye. And what they wanted to, to look at was, they wanted to study the binding affinity of drugs on this melanin, because this is typically uh, within our eyes. And if you have orphan drugs, you want to have um, a binding inside your eye. And so this was one thing they wanted to, to look at. And therefore they needed to, they, they wanted to see the effect of the origin of their melanin source on their binding assays they uh, developed. So the problem is from a portion eye, you get roughly around four milligrams, the 0 0.4 milligrams of melanin. And the question was, is there any possibility to determine the specific surface area with less material than compared to these normal quantities that's typically used? Of course, this depends on the specific surface area. The higher the specific surface area, the less material you need. But typically for a standard BET analysis, you have one to two grams. Then you could use DVS. That was one thing we thought about at the beginning, but um, the documentation, the applications we found were around 100 to 300 milligrams. So we tried to adapt the method and use it with smaller amounts as well. Because when you think about port eyes, this means for a standard BET analysis, you would have needed 5,000 eyes. And I mentioned, Paulina Jakubiak at the beginning, because she was doing a PhD during this um, time. And she really went to the slaughtery, got the protein eyes, and extracted this melanin from those eyes. I mean, of course, you first need to have these 5,000 eyes, and then you need to extract it in your lab. So the standard BT, roughly 5,000, with a the standard DVS method, around 250 to 750. And with our adapted method, it's around 70. So this significantly reduces the, the lab work for uh, Paulina here in that case. The question was, does it really work or not? So first of all, um, Flavio um, looked into the, the DBS instrument and uh, the application nodes. And of course, when you want to compare the, the, the data from a standard BT with the measurements we performed, you need to be sure you need to be aware that you use different probe molecules you use octane in case for the dvs and you have different conditions so you don't freeze your material it's an ambient temperature ambient pressure not under vacuum so the data might not be comparable directly to standard bt data but the ranking between the different sample types or the, the samples of different origin should work also with this uh, adapted BET method. As I mentioned, we didn't have any clue how that works on the DBS, but we tried it with lactose just to acquire some knowledge. Then we switched to the synthetic melanin um, samples because there you can get grams and kilograms of material. So we tried to set up the, the measurement with this synthetic melanin using small sample amounts. We run several cycles every time in order to reach a plateau. And then we compare those values to the literature data that we have for this uh, synthetic melanin. And then finally, we applied it to these biologic samples because of course we didn't want to waste the biologic samples and uh, the, the PhD student need to go back to the lab and uh, extract from another 70 eyes again because we just ruined it through our, through our experiments. So in principle, it worked. Otherwise, I wouldn't have shown you the data here today. Um, you can see the, 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 the BET plot you, you get from the software after the runs. Um, you can see that there is a per, uh, yeah, perfect, but a nice regression 
um, line and you can get extract the um, specific surface areas for your synthetic melanin but also it worked for the sepia melanin and uh, the portion melanin when you compare this now with the literature values um, you can see that um, synthetic melanin was analyzed with a standard BT measurement to be 11.8. We had 9.7. Uh, this was a triplicate determination in our case here. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but I mean, it's not so far away. And we need to keep in mind that we use different probe molecules and different conditions. What's nice with the DVS is that you really can see, we, we see differences, small differences. Um, the synthetic one has the lowest um, specific surface area. Um, you can see that the fit was for all, the regression line was for all very well. And um, what you also have within the BT equation is this uh, BT constant C, which somehow gives you an, an idea about the adsorbate adsorbent interaction strength. And um, to be honest, I'm, I, as I said, I'm not an expert in this, but what you can see here is that this constant is higher for the synthetic melanin compared to the biologic um, samples. And this makes absolutely sense in my opinion, because I mean, the synthetic one is the, the purest material you can get. And I would, See, uh, think also that the surface is much cleaner compared to the biological samples which were extracted on, on, on according to a, diff, uh, a, a certain uh, protocol. So I just mentioned that uh, the data correlated well with the literature well used. The constant C gives you an additional insight on the binding characteristics and this seems to be a suited technique to characterize and compare these different materials. Um, this data is published in a paper in Molecular Pharmaceutics, and one nice thing was that one of the um, reviewers was really pleased to see these. They, for them, it was a new DVS technique. Um, he was really really said that this is uh, the, one of the major um, innovations in this area, and uh, this was one of the. Uh, his positive aspects why this paper should be published. So for me, that was very interesting to see that for us, DVS as a standard technique, maybe not for BT, but as, as a standard technique. And in this case, this was really seen as one of the innovations within this project. With that, I want to conclude. I think I showed you that with these gravimetric BT determinations using the DVS, it allows you to, to detect the specific surface area for very small amounts of organic materials. Um, I also want to, to highlight that you analyze your sample in the ambient conditions, which means that you, you don't have a, a clean surface by vacuum or something like that. So it's really your sample you, you just put in your system. You need less sample amount, which is very advantage for early phase projects where you don't have so much material. And it's really ideal to compare different material qualities if you run a series and can compare your DBS um, data to, with each other. The summary for the first part on the control strategy, as I said at the beginning, a simple technique, just a balance and a humidity generator. It's, I'm, I'm a bit kidding, of course, but nevertheless, this technique has still a high scientific output due to the significant improvements in the instrument, like different detectors, different um, th these possibilities to, to analyze solvents and, and the Raman couplings. So these improvements really help us to, to understand our solid form landscapes. Um, it's also written here, these coupling techniques helps us also to generate more data from one run. So we just need one experiment and get additional data by this uh, Raman coupling. So nevertheless, old technique, but still very valuable in all our development projects. And with this, I would like to thank my colleagues from the Lab for Thermal Analysis, especially Flavio, Nico, and Pascal for their work, the colleagues from the Solid State Sciences Department, because most of the projects come from them as a 
analytical lab, you are more or less a cast, uh, analytical lab. Yeah? You're not producing the samples. And finally, I wanted to thank also Paulina Jakubiak and her supervisor because uh, this was really a, a nice work on this BET specific surface area. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And thanks also SMS for the possibility to um, present today within this webinar. Thank you very much for the great presentation, Dr. Sun. Uh, it was very interesting and also seeing a point of view from an industrial perspective is uh, uh, very useful.